Hey everybody, happy Cinco de Mayo 2017. Thank you so much for joining me today here on Brain Scratch. Hope you're having a wonderful Friday. Uh, I have to give a big thank you to Brain Scratcher Christy Groves, uh, who helped me research this case. Thank you so much, Christy. Uh, she's very passionate about trying to solve this case, and after looking in into it, I can see why. Um, this is a different type of mystery. We have covered one before with um, a person that has deceased and we're having trouble finding their identity, but this one, considering how much information is known about this case, this one really tops it. This is just a true brain scratch of a mystery, why we don't know who El Dorado, or El Dorado, let me pronounce that right, uh, in Arkansas, it's called El Dorado, uh, El Dorado Jane Doe actually is. And as you can see, we've got plenty of pictures of her right behind me. Let's jump into this case and take a look. Starting at Wikipedia, a list of identified murder victims in the United States. Of the thousands of people murdered every year in the United States, some remain unidentified. Many victims are not identified for years or even decades after they were killed, as in the case of Tammy Jo Alexander, who was murdered in 1979 and remained unidentified until 2015. Now, if you see they have it broken out by state here, we are going to jump to what is known as Union County Jane Doe in Arkansas. A woman estimated to be anywhere between 18 and 30 years of age was found deceased on July 10th, 1991 in El Dorado, Arkansas in room 121 of the Whitehall Motel. The decedent used multiple names, including Cheryl Ann Wick, which she used from a stolen identification card, Kelly Carr, also spelled with a K, Shannon Wiley, and Mercedes. She was known to have lived in various states prior to her death, including Texas, where she apparently worked as a prostitute. Other reports explain she had been arrested in the past using several of her aliases and had possibly been involved in a bank robbery on the East Coast. She had been shot by her boyfriend, who was convicted of the murder, but she remains unidentified. And that is one of the most interesting twists in this case. They know who killed her. He has served his time for it already. He's served a full sentence for it, has been let out. I think he was out for about five years, and then he got into another charge, I believe, for domestic uh, abuse, if I remember correctly, and now he's back in prison. Uh, and he has a very lengthy rap sheet. He's, he's spent most of his adult life in prison at this point. But that's what's so kind of nerve-wracking about this whole thing. Um, not only do we know who killed her, uh, he was essentially her boyfriend for at least a year before he did that. And does he know who she is? Is he holding out on the info? That is one of the major questions here outside of um, why is she hiding her identity so well? Why is she using so many different aliases? Why is she going as far as getting identifications made with other people's information? Uh, a lot of, lot of moving pieces to this mystery. Starting with an article at pilotonline.com, just to get some more of the basics here. Um, this was written in 2012 by Sarah Hutchins. Two decades after a woman was fatally shot in a southern Arkansas motel room, police in the small town of El Dorado still haven't closed her case. It's not that investigators can't find her killer. The man responsible was arrested, convicted, and sent to prison. What they still don't know is who exactly he killed on July 10th of 1991. Uh, over at Itchy Fish, they have written a good article on this, though once I started digging into my research, there's some things that um, don't quite line up with what this article has stated, so I've selected some parts that seem to be um, lining up with the other information that I have read. So just be careful if you read this article. Um, some of the details seem to be a little weird in it for me. Going by the name Kelly Lee Carr, police thought that the case would be quickly solved and they could send her back to her family. Kelly had also used the aliases Cheryl Ann Wick, Sharon Wiley, Mercedes, and the last name Stroud. She had been arrested in several states for prostitution and writing bad checks in Arkansas. It was only after her death that local police in El Dorado received a letter from the FBI stating that she was arrested in Virginia. She gave the name Kelly Lee Carr, age 24, and that she was wanted along the East Coast for bank robberies. Police are still not sure if any of the information she told others is even true. As she arrived in Arkansas, she began dancing at a strip club called The Carousel in Little Rock, 
where she told several other dancers her name was Kelly Carr and she was a runaway originally from Florida. Now at this point, I just want to say, I don't know if uh, authorities really thought her name was Kelly Carr when she was found. I believe they thought it was Cheryl Ann Wick, because there's another whole twist in this story where they contact the family of Cheryl Ann Wick to tell them that she has been murdered. And the family says, uh, well, we've just got in touch with her and she's alive and she's fine. We'll get to more details on that later. Police also found a large family Bible with the family name Stroud in it and several first names from the family. When police contacted the family in Houston, Texas, they stated they had taken a girl in a year earlier and she had given them the name Cheryl Ann Wick and that she was a runaway from Louisiana who had recently moved from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Police believe this name was fake and Kelly had stolen Cheryl's identity at random. Testing on her hair showed Kelly had traveled around the country frequently in the last three years of her life and that she had spent time in California, but mostly stayed to the eastern half of the United States and Texas in the last year of her life. Jumping over to NamUs, we see that they have her added in the unidentified persons database. And um, there's something interesting that goes on here. When you have a case like this, when you're talking about someone that is a known prostitute, potentially a criminal related to other cases. Um, first of all, it's somewhat hard to get a lot of press about that person out. There's just something about mainstream media that when they learn that someone is into um, these types of things, they kind of shy away from these stories. So in terms of mainstream media, there's only a few stories that are actually going through the details of this case. But if her name is profile is any indicator here, you can see that someone is working very hard to try to figure out who she is. Um, I haven't seen a list of exclusions this lengthy before. So, uh, and I can tell you the Web Sleuths commun community has two threads going on this and primarily their threads seem to be people um, bringing up missing persons profiles and saying, could this be her? So uh, there's, there's a lot of people working on this to try to figure it out, but uh, if you do get involved in trying to figure this out for yourself, be sure that you come to NamUs. I'll have the link down below so that if you bump into any profiles you think could be her, come here and check this list of names to make sure that they haven't already been excluded. Now in terms of the information given here, um, there's not a whole lot. The main thing to know about her is they, they believe that she's pre-30. Um, I personally feel like she could be in her early 30s as well, but I'm certainly no expert. Minimum age they have listed here is 20, but by some other reports I've seen, um, people go back as far as 17, uh, depending on who you talk to. Weight, 162 pounds. And here's what's really interesting. Her height is 70 inches. Um, and I've actually seen that vary a little bit too. I've seen everything from, I mean, this is saying that she would be 5'10", um, but I've seen it go as high as six feet, depending on what reports you're reading. Uh, outside of that, in terms of distinguishing marks, she has multiple piercings. In terms of more physical description, we're going to jump to the email that Christy Groves actually sent to me with a summary on this case. Uh, her eyes were sky blue. She was between 5'10 and 5'11 feet tall, weighed approximately 170 pounds. Her ears were pierced twice on the left ear with a noticeable freckle on the upper lobe and three times on her right ear. She has a slight scar on her left cheek on the upper cheekbone um, and a scar on the top of her left ear. On the right side of her face, she also has a small scar at the exterior outer curve of her right eye. And we have another one. She had a slight scar on the top lip, probably not noticeable to the naked eye at first. So. Uh, and outside of that, we just have all these pictures of her. So it's certainly very interesting to me that she hasn't been identified yet. And like I said before, that's a big part of this mystery. The Huffington Post cracked into this case in March of 2016. Uh, David Lohr did a pretty good job on this article. Uh, of course, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but if you are interested in this case, I highly recommend you come check it out. He was in contact with the boyfriend uh, that wound up killing her and uh, did a lot of corresponding with him in jail. At the end of this article, you will also find a link to all of the letters that that man sent to David. So you can literally read through the whole chain for yourself. After I go through this article, I'll let you know what I think about that chain a little bit. She was known in the clubs as Mercedes. 
And here's a picture of her with James Ice McAlphin. Uh, and this is actually the location where she would later have her life taken from her. The story of Mercedes is that of a woman who had a history of prostitution and frayed relationships. James Ice McAlphin, her lover and alleged pimp, was convicted of killing her. McAlphin, who is breaking his silence for the first time, claims he's the only person who truly knows who she was. Quote, the identity is not a mystery to me, McAlphin told HuffPost from inside East Arkansas Regional Unit, a correctional center in Mariana, Arkansas. But if you solve this cold case, you'll find that you're also solving a couple more cold cases. But McAlphin isn't talking. He suggested in letters to the Huffington Post that he knows the truth, but isn't quite ready to tell it. Dismissed by some as an intention seeker, McAlphin said Mercedes shot herself with his gun, a story that seems to ignore the witnesses who saw him hit Mercedes, fire the fatal shot, and flee with the weapon. Now, from the reports I've read, they didn't have a witness that actually saw him shoot her. Um, they were fighting outside of the hotel room. Uh, he hit her, dragged her back into the hotel room, and then very quickly after he pulled her into the hotel room, there was a shot. So I believe there is an assumption here that he literally knocked her to the ground, walked into the room, pulled the gun, and shot her very quickly. His story, if you read through all the email or the regular mail, uh, snail mail that he sent, um, his story is that she actually shot herself, that she had grabbed his gun, held it to her head, and then he said, yeah, you'd be doing us both a favor or something like that, and then she shot herself. But according to the witness statements, it seems like there wasn't enough time for all that interaction to go on, and he was already attacking her. One witness in particular said it seems like she was trying to get away, and he was literally muscling her back into the room. So I don't know if his story really lines up with theirs. McAlphin, jailed on a domestic battery charge, said he'll reveal Mercedes' real identity if someone pays him $4,000. And they actually show a little snippet of the letter up here. He wants 2,000 wired first into his account, and then once uh, these other cold cases are solved, he wants 2,000 more. That's one of the interesting things about the letters, if you do read them all, about his communication with the author of this piece. Um, it's very obvious from the start that McAlphin wants something and he wants money, he wants a specific amount, then he starts kind of bringing in these excuses of why he wants it. He says he needs to buy a media player. Apparently you're able to buy these things in the, at least in the correctional facility he's in. Uh, you can get a media player, buy a keyboard for it, and then you're able to send and receive email. Um, and he is literally begging this guy for that for money to buy that media player over and over and over. He even sends him a scan of the catalog where this would come from um, and just keeps insisting that he needs it to communicate with the author of this piece, even though they're communicating fine using snail mail. Um, by the end of the thread, he's asking for even less. He's also wrapped up another excuse for needing the money in that he has parole coming up and if they let him out, he needs to be able to prove that he has somewhere to live. None of his family is around anymore, so there's no one to help him with that. He needs to show that he can afford a couple months rent, so that's why he needs this money. Um, as the chain goes on, that all kind of devolves. Uh, turns up that some other family member pops up, so he doesn't need that much money anymore. Somehow he does get one of these media players. I don't know if David wound up sending him a little bit of money to do that. Um, but the media player gets stolen, so he needs more money for another media player. Um, and in, by the way, I looked at the catalog for this media player. Uh, you could also literally buy songs for it. They were like two bucks per song. Um, it just makes me wonder, is this guy, is he just gouging this author because he's trying to, you know, get an iPod essentially and get it loaded up with enough music to entertain him while he's sitting in there? I don't, it was really weird because the way the letters were written, it was like at the start, you almost kind of believe that, okay, it seems like he might be trying to be helpful, but then literally by the end of every letter, it's like, I need this, here's what you have to do for me. Um, but by the end of the total chain, uh, he is basically down to saying, just give me four or five hundred bucks. And at the end of the chain, which they really don't go into in this article, and I think 
if, if they were a little bit more fair with their journalism, they would, but I could see how it would take some of the teeth out of this, the interest of this article. Uh, by the end of the chain, he's starting to say that he's not even sure if he could remember the real name that she had told him, that he's really not certain. She probably only said it a couple times, and she could have even been lying to him, so maybe he doesn't know it at all. So the conversation just, it really starts from this point of, yeah, I can help you, I have all this info, I just need money. The money amount dwindles down, and then pretty soon, well, I really can't help you anyway. I don't even remember, and the info that I do have might not be all that great. He even gives a couple names towards the end in terms of first names, even though he insists in the middle of this chain that he can't give him the first names because he knows that he'll just go look up missing people and uh, look, at, look at him by first name and find her and associate it that way. So it is, it's a pretty interesting read to actually kind of get a little bit of a glimpse into the mindset of this guy as it is now with him actually sitting in prison. You get a very firm sense of what is important to him and is it necessarily telling the truth or helping other people in this case? Not from what I read, not, not in the least bit. The couple's tumultuous relationship, according to friends and police, would often send Mercedes to the emergency room with injuries she claimed McAlphin had inflicted on her. Mercedes also had run-ins with police for prostitution and bad checks. She was often booked under the name Cheryl Ann Wick, a name she sometimes used around El Dorado. Occasionally, she would spell Cheryl with an S. Um, one thing I'm wondering, um, maybe they were able to, because she had local charges there under that name, maybe they took her fingerprints and then that's how they came to the name uh, Cheryl Ann Wick. So it's possible that they thought she was Kelly Carr. I, I, I don't know. I've, I've seen it written two completely different ways. In some instances, everyone insists she was known as Cheryl Ann Wick. Her friends all knew her by that. The people that saw what happened to her knew that that was her name. Uh, in that other article where we started this video, they were trying to say it was Kelly Carr, but that's really the only place where I've seen that. And I already told you, I kind of questioned some of the facts in that article. And here we even have a booking photo of El Dorado Jane Doe following an arrest by police in El Dorado, Arkansas. Uh, I believe this was done just a year before uh, she passed away. So this is probably a pretty close likeness to what she looked like. Looking at this photo, um, I personally have the feeling this is someone in their late 20s and I just, I personally think that she could be in her early 30s. I certainly don't think she would be over 35 years of age, but um, I don't know. Uh, for all the discrepancies I'm seeing on her age, it's, it's really tough and it is hard to tell because certainly some people seem to age at different paces than others, kind of depending on your lifestyle. Um, with the lifestyle that she seemed to be leading, I would tend to think that she would look older. Um, but, you know, I'm not bumping into a ton of information about her having a lot of drug use or anything like that. Um, prostitution and stripping seems to be the, the main things outside of was she involved potentially with these bank robberies and then another crime which we're going to get into in a little bit here. McAlphin told police he wouldn't give them Mercedes' true identity unless we did something for him police said. Uh, the only thing he would tell detectives was that he had once met Mercedes' mother and sister. He said they lived in Florida, but refused to provide names. Florida keeps coming up in this case, and it's hard to know, is this just part of her story that she relayed to so many people that it keeps coming back, or is there some truth in it? Is she really from Florida? But I can tell you I've seen, not just from McAlphin, but from several other people that they've been told stories from her that she was from Florida or had spent some time in Florida. Authorities turned to Mercedes' personal belongings. They found a social security card and an identification card for Cheryl Ann Wick. Uh, the identification card had a photo of Mercedes. Uh, the article, I'm not gonna go into all the detail, but the article goes into, they actually reached out to Cheryl Wick. It tells a story about uh, her family calling her to see if she's okay after they've been notified she's dead, and of course she says, I'm fine, uh, and potentially where her, her social security card was stolen. And no one really kind of lines this detail out, but from what I've seen, it seems like it was just her social security card that was stolen. She didn't even notice that it was stolen at the time, and I think using that social security card, uh, Jane Doe was able to get an ID card with her own photo on it. I'm pretty sure that's how all that happened. 
They also found menus from restaurants in Texas and Virginia, diary entries in which she refers to Tyrone and Gail, and a Bible inscribed with family members with the last name Stroud. We already went over the detail on the um, Bible there a little bit. There is some images of her diary entries here. And um, this one primarily is talking about, it seems like she's in a fight. Uh, it doesn't really tell you if this is with uh, McAlphin or not, or if this is some boyfriend previous to that. But based on the date, uh, if they were together for a year, this should be him. Um, all I have to say about the diary entry is there's something very young about it. Um, when I read it, I almost imagine an extremely young girl writing it, like, like a 12-year-old or something like that. So it, it makes me wonder, you know, one of the theories around this is that maybe she was in foster homes or maybe she had run away at an extremely young age. Um, I kind of get the feeling that, that her developmental mentality when it comes to writing, I mean, there's a couple of misspells that are, that are kind of obvious in there, but also just the context of it. Um, I mean, admittedly, it's a diary, and she's talking in a bit of an informal way there, but it still seems extremely young to me. And I'm the same guy who's trying to say she could be older than people are estimating. So just another point where it's really hard to, to make sense of this case. McAlphin's niece, Danielle McAlphin, was a child when she first met Mercedes. Quote, when he brought her to my grandma's house, he said they had been in Florida. She was real sweet and kind-hearted. It seemed like she was running from something. I also remember thinking she was a stripper because of the stuff she wore and she had money like wads of money all the time. McAlphin said Mercedes chose to disguise her identity, quote, because the lifestyle she chose would have embarrassed the people she left behind. She was very young when she was taken. At one time she was taken from her loved ones by force, but as an adult it was willingly, McAlphin said. McAlphin said Mercedes was older than him. He said he was 26 when they met and she had two children. She left with someone in Fort Worth, Texas. And there are a couple of other instances where friends of hers were told that she had children that she had either lost or that she had left with someone. In one of the stories, she says that she left the children with her mother, but she didn't get along with her mother, so she was out of contact with them. In another one of the stories, her children were taken away, but she was using a false name, so she wasn't able to go and get them again. Um, so several different variations on this, and ultimately we don't even know if there really was children involved here or not, or maybe she was using that story for some level of sympathy. Uh, McAlphin goes into a lot of detail, particularly in the notes he wrote to David, the author of this article, um, and he even starts outlining what is essentially a sex trafficking organization. Uh, he thinks it has to do with the Fort Worth trio. He insists that those three girls that went missing from a mall in Fort Worth were taken by this circle of traffickers and that uh, Jane Doe is essentially part of that whole thing, but that Jane Doe was so cooperative that they let her stay in the U.S. Apparently girls that would not be cooperative would be given to another trafficking ring that was in Mexico and then Mexican girls would be swapped for them and brought to the U.S. and they would be essentially kept in custody. It's very disturbing, I have to say, just to read about me mechanisms like that and have someone speak about them kind of this casually and to realize that um, that could certainly effectively work. I mean, what would it take for a couple of these rings to be in different countries and to funnel these girls back and forth to keep them in control? Uh, he even goes in a little bit to the mindset of, you know, once, if, if they get them young enough and put them in this system, that once they become adults, they don't try to run away. It's just, it's part of their lifestyle at that point. And, you know, what are they going to go back to? I think there's there's this kind of shame that is accompanied with it that also helps keep them tied up. So I wasn't expecting to, to bump into that type of info in this case. Once again, is it really part of this case or not? Um, very hard to tell. If she was taken initially, I don't know why she would be embarrassed to let her family know where she was uh, or who she was when she was freed. He does say that she went kind of back into this lifestyle willingly is that enough of a reason for her to keep her identity out of this so that her family doesn't get embarrassed in some way? 
I think it's, it's a reasonable thought. Um, and then if you add the thought about children, is it something to do with her not wanting to embarrass her children? Is that why she worked so hard at changing her identities? I think that's certainly another potential aspect. Um, but you also have her being involved in some level of criminal activity time and time again. Is this just a chain of her swapping identities because she needs to, to avoid um, you know, warrants based on those other old identities, um, to essentially avoid being brought in for some secondary charge uh, if she's being you know, picked up for prostitution again. She could just give them a different name and then they don't associate it to a warrant from a previous charge. Um, it's, it's really tough. I, I don't know. I, I think it's, one thing is obvious. It's very important to her to keep swapping identities. There are so many aliases for her that she certainly was using it as a mechanism. Just is it a mechanism for her professional career or is it more of a mechanism for her personal life is really a big question here. I just, I can't answer. And just once again, I want to point out, he's saying that she was older than him. Uh, he also made some comment about her being really good with makeup and keeping herself up. But if they were 26 when they met and she was older, uh, we have to assume at least a year, but it could be more. Uh, we know that they were together for a year. That would certainly put her much closer to being 30 years old, potentially you know, 28, 29, 30 years old, somewhere around there. But once again, he didn't quite give us really good detail where we could look this up. I mean, if he specifically said, you know, yeah, she was 29 when we met, uh, we could go to NamUs, look up missing persons profiles, look for that specific age, and then drill it down very quickly. That is assuming that she's in NamUs. And I can tell you, I spent a large chunk of time looking at NamUs profiles, searching on those every which way. I personally hand reviewed probably over 75 records um, after drilling down eye color, getting her height at the right spot. I left the state search wide open um, and I went through all those profiles. I did find a couple that are kind of interesting. I'm going to send them over to Christy because she's already communicating with NamUs on another person that she, she thinks could have fit that profile. That person also came up in my search, so I, I'm hoping that we get some follow-up on that. But there is no specific law that all the law enforcement agencies have to have their active missing person cases in NamUs. Tune in to Johnny Vogs next week because we're going to talk a little bit more about that. NamUs is working on it and I think they've got something good going. But right now as it is, we can't assume that every state has their active missing person records in there. So those 75 profiles I looked through, it could be that her file is in paper in some filing cabinet in some random police department office that we just don't know where to look or where to ask for to get that information. Once again, just very good article. Um, I really appreciate what the author was trying to do here and I also appreciate that they didn't wind up giving this guy any money. I think, um, I don't think it would have helped the case too much. I really am not sure if he has much good information. Um, do be sure if you read this article to go all the way to the bottom. You'll see that they have a link right here to 32 pages of communication with him. Uh, very interesting to read through. It's kind of hard in some places. It's not the best scan and his handwriting seems to kind of get worse as it progresses. Uh, here's that page I was telling you about where he's talking about the music player that he needs so that he can send email using a keyboard with a music player. Uh, I just, I'm kind of baffled that they even allow that. Uh, not just because it would get stolen by someone, but could potentially cause fights in there. Um, I just, I don't know, kind of amazing to me. There is also some official records about the court proceedings and essentially how he um, did a bit of a plea bargain to get a lesser sentence of um, second degree murder. We can see it right here. They even crossed out first degree and wrote second on there. So uh, he wound up with a 15 year sentence. He actually served 13 years. And this is a link to his information, his inmate information. Um, I got to tell you, after looking through this, I'm kind of surprised that he thought he was going to have any chance at parole because if you look at his disciplinary violations, he is just in constant trouble in jail. Uh, insolence to a staff member, 
failure to obey order, threat to inflict injury. Uh, he actually does have aggravated battery down here. This guy just has a history of being violent with people. Um, and you can also see he is trying to do some programs for stress management, anger management, communication skills. Um, but I don't think that that really offsets how many violations. This is just from July of 2015 here. Uh, so you're not even looking at two years. I mean, it looks like he's getting in trouble at least every other month. So I'd be very surprised if uh, he gets out early on that charge. And here's where we get to the interesting story of Dwayne McCorkendale, who was a truck driver that was murdered. And some people think that uh, Jane Doe might be associated with this. In Chandler, Oklahoma, an anonymous caller reported a body lying beside a phone booth at a highway rest stop. It looked like he was walking up to the telephone, perhaps counting change out in his hand, and was killed as he stepped up to make the call. Whoever was involved in this killed McCorkendale, just shot him in the back. Uh, it was a shotgun that was used. And he was dead before he hit the ground. Then checked him to see if he had any money on him, any valuables at all. Investigator Renfro estimated that the killer's take was no more than $25. Within days, several truckers called about a brown, a brown Ford Pinto equipped with a CB radio. We had reports that the Pinto was driving very erratically on the highway, trying to cut 18 wheelers off. Then when the truck driver would call them on the CB, they were abusive. They said, leave us alone or we'll do to you what we did to this other trucker. Three weeks later, authorities received a call from another trucker. He was breaking for lunch at a rest stop when he was approached by a young woman who was acting strangely. Quote, she was, I hate to say, but she looked kind of trashy. I mean, it looked like she had been on something and she was just awful shaky. I kind of tried to reach to get a map. The next thing, she's got her whole front half inside the truck. About that time, this brown Pinto pulled up and then she jumped out of the truck and they took off. Their only lead is the brown Pinto. The occupants of the car are described as a white male and a black male, sometimes accompanied by a white woman. Now, McAlphin in his letters um, does tell the story of a previous pimp that Jane Doe was with, and some people think that that pimp is part of this crime. And McAlphin originally is talking about that crime as being one of the things that is going to get cracked if her identity comes out. But then later in later letters, he says, no, 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 I'm not even talking about that one. There's other cold cases that'll get solved if I give you this information. But once again, he's pushing for money, so I don't know if that is, is really valid or not. But just another strange twist in this case. Was she part of this group of people that killed this man or not? I'm not sure. Another thing McAlphin says in his later letters is that he remembers that she showed him an issue of Outlaw Biker magazine from 1989 where she is in the magazine and she is appearing topless. So I don't know if any of you brain scratchers out there happen to have access to uh, 1989 Outlaw Biker magazines. I did some quick searches online. A few issues are available for purchase here and there, uh, but we don't know what month it is. And quite honestly, I think even if you found the picture, I sincerely doubt that it's gonna have any accurate information about who she is. It's probably gonna be one of her aliases that's in there, but worth looking into. I'm kind of surprised that Huffington Post didn't uh, follow up on that lead and just kind of, you know, I'm sure there's some library somewhere that has access to all of these articles or back issues and you know they, there might be something there we don't know it could be potentially that she's with someone in the picture that is someone they could follow up with there could be a, a little bit of a lead here but i did just want to mention that because um, it's one of the points that McAlphin might not be lying about you know you have to kind of assume that uh, some of the things he might be juicing trying to get this money, but there's some information in there that you know maybe he's lying 50% of the time. I don't know. I think it's hard to believe that he would be lying 100% of the time about everything that's in those letters. There is a Facebook page, El Dorado Doe. I'll have a link to that down below. I also found a very good Wix page on this case 
Uh, I mentioned that there is web sleuth threads. I'll have those in the description box below as well. Um, and I do have the NamUs profiles. I was thinking about sharing those with you guys, but I, I'd prefer that if you really want to help with this case, do your own searches, do your own digging in. I don't want to tilt your opinion one way or the other. Uh, just know that I will be following up with Christy on the ones that I found. We'll get them over to NamUs and possibly they'll get added to the exclusion list, which um, might help drill that list down even farther. Um, who knows? Who knows? All right, Brain Scratchers, this is where I turn it over to you. What do you think about this case? Do you think James McAlphin is telling the truth? Do you think that Jane Doe might have been tied to all these other crimes and maybe that's why changing her identity became so important? Or is this just a personal thing where she's trying to protect her family? Or was this a foster kid that jumped out of the system somehow um, and just took off with her own life? There's a lot of different aspects that could be going on here. Um, I do ask that we please stay respectful. I, I know she's a prostitute. I know some people have their sensibilities ruffled by that. Um, you don't have to spend any more time on this case if you don't want to help a person out. But for me personally, just because someone uh, happens to get into that lifestyle, maybe not even by her own choice, at least according to James, um, I don't think that we should leave anyone behind. I do believe it's important that she's identified if she does have two children out there, despite the fact it might be very hard for them to understand what happened to their mother, I think it is better than thinking that their mother might have abandoned them or had no plans to ever see them again or something along those lines, or to leave them searching for their mother for the rest of their life and never being able to find her, but not knowing that reality. So I do think there's value into looking in this case and raising exposure to it. I hope you guys feel the same way. Thank you so much for joining me on today's Brain Scratch. I hope each and every one of you out there has a great weekend. Take care. I'll see you right back here on Monday on the Lord and Mark's channel.